In this video, we're going to show you how to set up, connect, and how to use the best settings possible when you're connecting the Shure MV7 microphone with your Go XLR mini audio interface. I'm Jordan from Kettner Creative, and we make videos like this all the time with all types of tutorials and information for home studio equipment. So if you do want to see more videos like this in the future, please like and subscribe. If you're looking to purchase anything that you see in this video, we do have a bunch of links down in the description below where you can find current up-to-date pricing from a whole bunch of different retailers to make sure that you are finding the best price possible if you're looking to buy this equipment for your home studio. Now for the purposes of this video today, we have the Go XLR Mini already connected to the computer. The software is open and I do have it recording off the computer. And we're not going to use any of the USB functionality from the Shure MV7 at all. We're going to use it just as a straight XLR microphone. That way we can use all the software just from the Go XLR Mini. And that's going to help it get us the best result possible. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to connect the microphone to the Go XLR Mini. For this, I recommend just using a standard XLR cable. Do not use a cable like the one I'm holding right now that goes XLR to 8th inch and then using the other mic input on the front of the Go XLR Mini. You will not get as good of a preamp with that solution as if you use a normal XLR cable. So we can use the Midas preamp that is built into the Go XLR. So I'm going to use this XLR cable now to connect the microphone to the Go XLR Mini. Now that the XLR cable is connected, we need to quickly make sure that we have good mic placement before we go into any of the settings. This will really help set up the foundation and make sure that all the settings in the software work properly. You want to be about a fist away from your microphone. Ideally, you want it slightly off axis so the majority of the breath leaving your mouth goes by the microphone and not directly into the diaphragm of the microphone. I do find that the Shure MV7, even though it does have some pop filtering, the foam windscreen, etc., it is still susceptible to plosives, which are those P and B sounds. They can be pretty disruptive to the microphone. So if you have it slightly off axis, that will help. If you're too far back from the microphone, you'll notice that you do need to overcompensate by turning up the gain in the software. That will make the microphone sound like it's a little edgy. You'll notice it's more sensitive. You'll hear more background noise and that type of thing. If you get too close to the MV7 here, you'll notice it gets really bassy and boomy and you'll have to do a whole bunch of EQ to compensate. So for best results, just stay about a fist away and keep the microphone pointed at your mouth but not directly in front of where all the air is leaving your mouth. Now that we got that out of the way, we can open up the mic setup window. On the left hand side, we want to make sure that it is selected on dynamic. We don't want condenser. If you select condenser, it'll send 48 volts of phantom power to the microphone. That won't necessarily hurt the Shure MV7. It's definitely not recommended, but it certainly will not help this microphone in any way whatsoever. So if there's no benefit and you have a slight, slight chance of damaging the microphone, just leave it off and that will solve that problem. As mentioned earlier, we don't want to use the 3.5 millimeter input on the Go XLR. We do want to be using an XLR cable to connect these two. That will give you the better Midas preamp that's built into the Go XLR Mini. Next, we have the gain. You can see here as I'm speaking into the microphone, my computer does seem a little bit laggy right now with the screen recording software, but typically it would show and be more responsive and show me right in the good area. That's what you want to be seeing when you're using this microphone if the gain is set correctly. Then you can hit OK. Once we have the gain set up, I am going to put on my headphones here so we can hear what we're doing with the rest of the settings. The first thing that we're going to work on is setting up our noise gate. What the noise gate will do is you can think of it as a way of automatically muting your microphone when you're not speaking into the microphone. So this would be helpful if you do have a lot of background noise. If you have fans, roommates, air conditioners, uh, loud PC noise or anything like that, 
the noise gate will help mute those sounds. Now, the downside of using the noise gate too aggressively or at all is that you can hear it cutting in and out. So it's best to use it only when you're able to mask the sound of that noise gate with some game noise. So if you are live streaming while you're playing along with a game, then that's when I would use a noise gate. I wouldn't recommend a noise gate if you're just doing a talking head video like I'm doing right now. In that case, it's usually more distracting than it's worth, but it can be a helpful tool, like I said, if you can mask it with game noise. I'm going to go through some settings here for the noise gate. As I turn it up, you're going to be able to hear it cutting in and out. You're going to notice that some syllables of mine are getting clipped. That's a sign that your noise gate is set too aggressively. For me, I like setting it at about minus 50 if I'm going to use it at all. That means that the noise gate breaks almost instantly once I start speaking. Assuming that your gain is set up correctly, then this should work pretty well for you. Even then, you can hear it cutting in and out when I breathe in and out during the silences between my speaking. That's the type of thing that I would want to avoid, but it can be masked, like I said earlier, if you do have other background noise like music or game noise. Next for the attenuation is how much is getting muted when the noise gate is in. What this means is when I'm not speaking, I want it to only mute 50% of the background noise. That's my recommended setting. That helps to buffer it a little bit to make it sound a little bit more natural as you speak to make sure that it's not really clipping hard in and out. So for this, I would go minus 50 and 50%, and you can leave the attack and the release at 10 milliseconds and 200 milliseconds, respectively. But as mentioned before, since I'm doing a talking head video right now, I am just going to turn off the noise gate to avoid the distraction of hearing it click in and out. Next, we have the EQ. The EQ is how you shape the sound of the microphone. So what I like to do with the EQ is I don't like going after that big AM radio authoritative boomy EQ setting. For me, I want to create an EQ setting that will play nice with the live stream that I'm doing. I want to make sure that my microphone sounds nice and clear, but I also want to create space for other instruments. In this case, another instrument or sound source would be your game noise or music or video that you're playing along to. Now, a good example of this would be is if you're mixing sound for a live band on a stage, you want to be able to hear the kick drum and the bass guitar separately. You want to hear instruments and sound sources that are typically using the same frequencies isolated into smaller frequencies. Things like pianos, acoustic guitars, and lead singers, you want to create space. That way you can set all the levels to a similar level, stand back from the mix, and you should be able to hear each instrument or sound source separately. That's what you want to be able to do when you're mixing for your live stream as well. You want to create space for the game noise, but at the same time, you want to make sure that when you're speaking in the microphone, you can be loud clearly without having to turn the volume up on all the frequencies and creating a muddy mix. You want a nice, clean sounding, crisp mix. So to do that here, we're going to turn on the enable fine tune. I'm going to sweep some of these frequencies around to get better what I'm looking for with the EQ setting on the Shure MV7. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to sweep the first channel all the way to the left to 30 hertz. We're going to bring it down to minus 9. We're going to sweep the second channel here all the way to 120. I'm just going to type it in, 120 hertz, and leave it at 0. What this will do is it'll create a bass roll-off, also known as a high-pass filter, to take some of the mud and basically take this microphone out of everybody's subwoofer. The subwoofer crossover is typically somewhere between 80 hertz and 120 hertz. So by going with 120 here, we make sure that we do take it out of everybody's sub. Next, at 400 hertz here, we do want to bring this down to about minus 2, sometimes minus 3, but minus 2 is a little bit more conservative. This low-mid cut is where there's a lot of frequency response from things like music and game noise and all that. So we do want to create a bit more clarity. You can also hear, I'm sure if your headphones are on right now, you heard how it really cleans up the vocal, makes it sound quite a bit more clear. There's not a lot of intelligibility that comes from 400 hertz of the human voice. We're just going to clean that up. But we do want the frequencies to come all the way back up when you hit 0.8 kilohertz, back to where they should be at zero. 
Next, we're going to do a bump at 2.5 kilohertz of plus 2. The main intelligibility for your voice, depending on how your voice sounds, will be somewhere between 1.5 kilohertz and 3 kilohertz. So by bumping 2.5 here, I'm just taking the middle of the road, middle of that spectrum, and bumping it up to make it sound a little bit more clear and intelligible so your voice will really stand out amongst all the other competing frequencies on your live stream. Next, we want to sweep the last band here to 12K and do a cutoff of minus 2. You can go minus 3 if you want. But again, after here, those really high frequencies, they don't add a lot to the live stream or the clarity of your voice. So we're just going to take them out completely and clean up it as much as possible. So this will give you a really good EQ profile here where we've done two things. We've created space for the other sounds on your live stream, and we've also made your voice sound nice and clear as clear as possible. Next, we have the compressor. The job of the compressor is to narrow the dynamic range of your microphone. What this means is it'll make some of your loudest moments a little bit quieter and some of your quieter moments a little bit louder. It'll make it so you're not having to ride the fader up and down throughout your entire live stream. You can kind of think of it as a way of auto mixing. That's one way to think of it. But if you do go too aggressive with the compressor, it'll take the emotion out of what you're doing. Likewise, if you don't compress enough, like I said, you're just going to be chasing the fader and you're going to have to do a lot more work. So there is a sweet spot in the middle where it's a tool that's helpful. It'll make your voice more predictable within the mix because like I said, the main goal of all of this is to make it really easy to be heard amongst all the other competing noises. So you want it nice and predictable, but you don't want to rob it or just make it sound like you put a limiter on the whole thing. To do that, I like setting the threshold at minus 15 dB and the ratio to 3.2 to 1. What this means is if we peak at 0 dB, so right now I'm probably floating somewhere between minus 20 and minus 10. So as I go up and I break minus 15, everything after that point will get compressed at 3.2 to 1. That's a really helpful tool. You can go higher with the compression ratio, but I don't recommend it. You can go 4 to 1 if you really want, but I would never go higher than 4 to 1. Now, like I said, the compressor will make your loud moments quieter, which we've just done. Now, how do we make your quieter moments a little bit louder and a little bit more predictable as well? You can do that with the makeup gain. So you can add 5 dB of makeup gain here. And what this will do is it will push you into the compressor. I'm sure you heard it get a little bit louder right now. It'll push you up into that compressor, so then the compressor is working more, so we're working right inside that compressor. I really do wish that we had some sort of a compression meter so you could see how it worked, but it's pretty cool to see the compressor working and kicking if you do have a meter for a compressor. Anyway, so that would be a really good compressor setting, something like minus 15, let's get type it in, 3.2 to 1, and then 6 dB or 5 dB on the makeup gain is typically what I'll use. Now on the Go XLR Mini here, we don't have a de-esser, so we don't have that tool that the full-size Go XLR does, but that's okay. It's still really helpful for everything else that we're doing on our live stream. So I'm just going to go through it all again. You can put the gate on at minus 50 and set your attenuation to 50%. I'm not going to do it right now because we don't have a lot of background noise and I don't want to hear the noise gate clicking in and out. For the EQ here, we did a lot of sweeping with the enable fine tune, but basically we created a high pass filter, a low mid cut to create some room in the voice here. We did a bump at 2.6 kilohertz there to add to intelligibility, and then we did a high cut as well because it's, those frequencies are wholly unnecessary when you're doing a live stream. Then for the compressor, we set the threshold to minus 15 dB and the ratio to 3.2 to 1. Again, just to bring it down a little bit, and we did add a little bit of makeup gain to push us back up into that compressor, so we're working it all the time when we're speaking. I hope this video is helpful. If you do have any other questions about this setup, please leave a comment down in the comment section below. Again, if you are looking for pricing or specs for anything that you see here, we have a bunch of helpful links down in the description below. And if you want to see more videos like this in the future, please like and subscribe. Thank you for watching.